Welcome everyone to the Entertainment Buffet Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Brandon Prosek. Uh, this week, uh, Jess is not going to be here, uh, so I decided to bring on uh, another great guest. Uh, I love bringing on guests uh, to hear about some different subjects because today we are going to be talking with a published novel author and uh, someone who I've gotten to collaborate with in the past. And uh, I'm so excited she could be here, Sarah Archer. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Brandon. Yeah. So uh, before we, you know, dive into uh, the podcast here, why don't you go ahead and you know fill everyone in on uh, what you what you do, what you're working on, and a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a writer. I write a little bit of everything. I do uh, fiction, and I had my first novel, um, which is called The Plus One, come out a couple of years ago. I'm working on a second novel now, and I also do short stories. Um, I do screenwriting, both fiction or both uh, pilots and features. Um, I write some poetry. <laughs> I kind of like to dabble in a little bit of everything. And I live in North Carolina. This is where I'm from. I moved around a whole lot, including living and working in LA for a little while um, in the entertainment industry, and then eventually made my way back here in North Carolina. So I kind of took the long, complicated road home, but <laughs> that's where I am today. Cool. Um, but yeah, uh, the plus one, uh, which uh, I was able to listen uh, to on Audible. Um, so uh, before we like dive into, because what I want to hear about and what this podcast is going to be about is as someone who is a published writer, we want to hear when it started from the idea all the way to getting published, uh, what that process was like for you. Um, real quick, do you want to plug where the Plus One is available? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's available at most major bookstores, Barnes and Noble. Um, you can order it through your small local booksellers too. Even if they don't have it in stock, bookshop.org is a, a good place to do that. Um, an easy place to find links is my website, which is sararcherwrites.com, W-R-I-T-E-S. Dot com and I have links to the book on there, to my social media, I have a blog. So that's a good kind of one-stop shop to find everything. Awesome. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i someone who's partial to audiobooks. So that's mm -hmm. why I uh, checked it out there. Also just so busy, it's, it's, it's an easier way to, I was able to listen uh, during work and during driving and so forth. Um, and I just listened to this last week, uh, all last week. So it's, it's very fresh. Um, uh, and would you like to give everyone just kind of like a brief, you know, almost like the, the log line pitch on, uh, on what the plus yeah. one is? Sure, so it's a romantic comedy, um, but it has some kind of sci-fi elements to it as well. It's about a robotics engineer who builds the perfect boyfriend. <laughs> so um, it's a little bit like the movie Weird Science, but in reverse, like a female take on weird science. But it, it goes a lot deeper into the actual relationship in that movie. Um, it's, it's much more about kind of this engineer eventually over time starting to see the robot as like a real person and developing a real relationship with him and goes into questions about, you know, how do humans relate to machines and AI and that sort of thing. Um, but overall, it's a comedy. It's, it's mostly meant to be enjoyable and funny. Definitely. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's funny and it is relatable. And uh, I think uh, later on when, after we talk about, uh, after we get to how it was published, I'd love to talk about like some, uh, some of my thoughts on it, but not necessarily spoilery. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, uh, so this, as you said, just uh, was published a couple years ago in 2019, right? Yeah, that's right. All right. So let's go ahead and go all the way back. Uh, when did you first get the idea for the plus one? So I think it was 2015. Um, I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I think it was right before I moved out of LA. And I don't know about you, but for me, like the moments when I tend to get writing ideas are when I'm kind of on autopilot. Like this time I was stuck in bumper to bumper traffic, so I wasn't moving. <laughs> or, you know, it's like when I'm brushing my teeth or taking a shower or stuff like that, like my brain starts going and that's when I get ideas. So I was, I was sitting in traffic and I thought of it initially as, like I mentioned, um, kind of weird science in reverse. So for people who don't know weird science, it was this 1980s, I think John Hughes directed it, um, movie about like these two teenage guys who build sort of their perfect robotic woman. And I think it all takes place over the course of a single day and night. It's been years since I watched it. 
Um, but that one is very much about like the comedy and the hijinks of it. And I thought it would be fun to do sort of a reverse of that story where it was a female robotics engineer building her perfect boyfriend. But I knew right off the top that I wanted it to be a little bit more in depth and see kind of the relationship play out over a longer time period. Um, so it was one of those moments where I was like sitting in my car and I got this idea and I was like scrambling through my notebook and my purse because I started like getting ideas that I wanted to write down. <laughs> so I, I saw kind of the overall arc of the story pretty quickly. Um, and then as I was writing it, a lot of the work that I did was more about developing the characters and kind of figuring out where they were going to go. Um, so I wrote it in 2015. I was working on some other stuff throughout. So I kind of spent like those first two years, 2015 and 16, working on it and revising it um, in between other projects. And I believe it was 2017 when I started querying agents. So, okay. so that, quick question on yeah. that, that writing in the beginning there, when you first got the idea, um, did you always see it as a novel or were you toying whether it was a movie or like what was the first intentions? Because I feel like everyone, it could always change or it could always be adapted from one genre, uh, one type of medium to another, but was that always like kind of your first thought when you had the idea? You know, I think when I first thought of it, I was thinking it could be either a book or a movie. Um, and like I mentioned at the time I was living in Los Angeles, I had never written a book before. I had done like a few short stories, but I hadn't really written much fiction. Um, so most of my experience at that point was in screenwriting, but you know, I grew up as a reader. I loved reading books and I always knew that I wanted to write a book. It was just something I had never had never done and had never really had the time to do. Um, so when I left LA and I wasn't working those like crazy assistant hours, you know, 12 hour days and then trying to network after work and all of that, I finally had the time to write a novel, um, which I had never tried before. So I think it was something where I, I saw the idea as potentially working in either medium up front, but I decided, well, I want to write a book, so why not take this time to do it? Um, and I think one of the things that I liked about doing it as a novel was it allowed me to get a little bit more into the head of the main character, which obviously is harder to do on screen, but just sort of getting into like her thought process and how she feels emotionally about things was, um, was interesting for me and kind of a good exercise as a writer. I think it helped push me because we're not as used to doing that in screenwriting. Yeah, because uh, that's one thing. Uh, I, I come from more of a screenwriting background. Uh, I, I have done some plays. I've done, you know, short videos, short films, and so forth. Uh, but that's one thing that I feel like books are always going to trump uh, movies, television, and so forth. Because sure, movies and television can always do voiceover, or they can have a narrator of some right. sort um, that like describes things. But like books are you know, there is no time constraint, mm -hmm. you know, obviously with scripts, whether it's movie or TV, we're, we're constrained to whatever format, like whether it's got to be an hour or two hours or mm -hmm. 30 minutes. So like a book, you can, you can really go all over the place. And I think that was one thing that when I was reading it, and we'll, we'll get into it more later, was just like how certain things um, that I knew would probably happen happened earlier than I thought. And then there was more story like it, it uh, um, it's not that I didn't know what you were going to do with it per se. It was just uh, there, it was a lot more in depth because I, I am not so much of a reader when it comes to like books. And uh, I always say I'm, I'm the writer who doesn't like to read, but it's, it's more so that like the book format for me is very like, I, I get really bad with reader comprehension and I feel like I just like get lost. Uh, so that's why it's like scripts or comic books are like formatted differently or audio version, like audio, I was able to follow along. Whereas like if I was reading, I probably would have, you know, not been as great. Uh, but yeah. Yes, yeah um, I'm the total opposite. Cause like <laughs> I'm a very visual person. So reading things on the page works for me, but audiobooks it's really difficult to concentrate. <laughs> like it goes in one ear and out the other. So I'm jealous that you can like listen to audiobooks while you're doing other things. Cause I would love to be able to do that because I could read so much more. <laughs> but I, just, I don't pay attention when I'm just hearing it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, but I think uh, what helped too is your writing was like in depth and descriptive and like, you know, obviously there's funny moments both like physically and dialogue wise but it wasn't 
Like, I guess it's just me. I feel like sometimes maybe it's just like the books we grew up having to read for like school or college and such, where it's like, mm -hmm. they're just describing something way too much. And I'm like, is this thing they're describing even important? Yeah. You know, whereas like, I felt like you kept to like, this is the plot. These are the characters. These are the moments that felt like these things matter for a reason or something will come back for later. Um, so that I appreciated. I think that's what made it a little bit more easy to listen to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that I do have a screenwriting background. So I'm used to, like you were saying, like sticking to a certain format, sticking to a certain length really focusing on like just what you need for the story. Mm -hmm. um, and even in writing the plus one, I, I was kind of like stretched out of that a little bit. And I feel like since then, as I'm working on a second book and trying more short fiction and stuff, I'm experimenting more with like getting a little bit more into the literary side of things and describing things more. Um, but I, I think the way I think about story is very plot oriented and structure oriented just because of that screenwriting background. So I can see how, especially if you were listening to something, it would make it easier to follow along that way, as opposed to like very literary fiction that is focused on the language itself. Like it might be helpful to really focus on the page with that. Yeah. So um, you had the, you know, you had the inspiration and you figured it would make most sense for a book. Mm -hmm. um, was it, uh, how long would you say from like when you first got the idea to where you, you, you mentioned, was it like a couple of years before you started kind of inquiring uh, or what was that timeline like? I know yeah. you're juggling other writing, but. Yeah, it was, I think it was a couple of years because I was sort of working on other things off and on. Um, and normally, I mean, I know you and I have traded writing for feedback. Like you, you know how important it is to get feedback and notes on stuff. And I'm a big believer in that too. With this, because it was my first novel, and most of my writer friends at that point were screenwriters, I didn't really have many people I could reach out to to read and give me notes. Um, so normally I would, you know, in that process, I would be giving it to, to friends and people in writers groups and trying to get feedback. And I really didn't with this, which is not a good idea. Like before you start sending it out to agents, you should definitely get feedback from other people. <laughs> but I was just kind of working on it on my own at that point. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then. Which I guess one thing that makes, uh, I, I, because, you know, we, we, like we said, we've exchanged like pilots or, or, or films and such is like, there are, a more like anywhere from 30 to 100 so page count like uh and obviously i just listened to it so how how many pages is the plus one or like how long was like your early drafts because like um, that's probably also just a commitment to get someone to read that and yeah, and a rough estimate sure. is fine i know it was years ago i mean i think well i'm looking at the book now it's about 300 pages in the printed published version. Um, I think the word count was probably 80 something thousand, um, which is pretty standard for that genre. And I mean, that's a very good point. Like I have, I have some writers groups that are focused on screenwriting and some that are focused on fiction or other genres. Um, and for the ones that do screenwriting, or at least one of them, we do typically read like an entire script at once because that's pretty feasible to do for one meeting. Um, but for my fiction writers groups, typically you have to send stuff in smaller chunks, like 2,000 words at a time or 3,000 words at a time or something. So you're only getting notes on a little portion at once, which makes it a lot harder to address like structure and you know character development and bigger picture stuff. But it's just, you can't ask people to read like a whole novel for every yeah. meeting, you know, or to, to wait long enough to let everyone else get their novel read before you get notes. Um, so it is a much bigger ask to get someone to read your, your manuscript as opposed to a script, which is why like screenwriter friends, I wasn't going to ask them to do that because <laughs> a lot of, you know, a lot of Hollywood people don't really read many books. <laughs> yeah. I, I say that with, with respect. For <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Do you have, uh, do you say you have the book with you? Do you have a physical copy? Uh, yeah. You want to sh show it up for the camera? Yeah. I don't know if it shows up very well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. I, I'm going to have to yeah. get a physical copy at some point. Oh, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I, so that's gotta be a very difficult process. Uh, how different would you say, whether it was like characters or plot from like your first, like, all right, I finished a draft to like what it became. Like, would you mm -hmm. say like, there's some dramatic differences? Like some people, when it comes to draft to draft, they may have like 
removed an entire character or maybe added scenes or added, you know, certain things. Was there any wild changes? And you don't have to necessarily get, but uh, I, I just always find it interesting from like first draft to final draft, like how yeah. different was it? I would say, I mean, there wasn't that much that changed in terms of the story. I think the biggest story change was there was a wedding, which is a kind of pivotal event in the story, which originally I had much earlier and then ended up moving closer to the midpoint of the story. Um, but other than that, the, the story I pretty much had early on and that didn't really change much. More of the changes came with, and th these were especially when I started working with my agent and getting her notes and then working with my editor subsequently and getting her notes. Um, a lot of the characters or the changes were more about like deepening the characters and relationships. Um, a lot of tonal changes, like when I first wrote it, it was more satirical. It was more focused on the comedy. It was a little bit like bitier, I guess you could say. Um, and a little bit more sort of out there and eccentric in some ways. And they had me um, steer it slightly more towards the romance side of the kind of romantic comedy balance and soften the characters a little bit and also like dig into the characters and relationships a little bit more. Um, so some of those changes I think were about like gearing it towards the book market as opposed to the, the screen market that I was used to and um, just making it more of like a, a character focused novel. So. It, it wasn't really so much changing the story, but within the scenes that I had, there were more changes to the characters and that sort of thing. Sure, which I guess uh, one thing I will say too, like it is a romantic story, but it's not like a full on, like hardcore romance. Yeah. Uh, not uh, not something that's like, oh, if you're only into super romantic things, like it, it to me, it is like, it is comedic with some romance with, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, some sci-fi elements and, um well when we're talking more about the story uh, yeah just i i found some of the characters really uh really relatable um uh so yeah uh now at this time when you're kind of writing did you already have an agent or where uh, did you, that come later that came later so I, I wrote the book first and then i started um like i mentioned before querying agents which is basically where you send out um query letters to agents who you don't know most of the time. So most agents will have information on their websites or social media or somewhere about like how to query them because most people are open to cold queries. Um, they may, they usually don't take many of those books just because they're inundated with, with requests all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but usually they are at least open to reading them. So uh, you basically send out a letter that will have like a brief synopsis of the book and a little bit of information about yourself and maybe like a log line and some comps for other books that you would compare it to, that sort of thing. And depending on what the agent wants, you might also be sending, um, it might just be the letter, it might also be like the first 10 pages or a synopsis or something like that. And so you send out these queries to agents and wait to hear back. And sometimes um, if they're interested, they'll, they'll let you know and they want to read the whole manuscript. Sometimes they'll send you a rejection letter. Sometimes they just don't say anything, which is typically a, you know, a rejection after a certain period of time. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> you just kind of figure, okay, I guess they're not interested. So I started that process and I was like gradually sending out letters on sort of a rolling basis as I was researching agents and finding people who I thought might be a good fit. And I, I did that for a couple months, I think, um, before I found an agent and started working with her. And so then I started the revision process with her and, and her assistant um, getting their feedback, which helped to shape the manuscript a lot. Okay, and then I think I remember you saying uh, was the, the title was way different before, right? Yeah, it was, so when I was querying it, um, I think it was called How to Make and Kill the Perfect Man, <laughs> which is, you can, you can tell it was like a little bit leaning more into the comedy and the weirdness. <laughs> Um, but the plus one was a, a title that we came up with like, later, like once it was already with a publisher. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously meant to bring in like the romance angle, like plus one, like a date that you would bring somewhere, but also like, the, you know, an equation, like this is basically our, my English major take on like, oh, it sounds mathy and sciencey. <laughs> <laughs> so it's supposed to be a little bit of a, a double meaning there. <laughs> yeah, I, um... That's interesting. Uh, so you said it was how to make and kill the perfect man. Yeah, yeah, that was my my working title. Yeah, I see both options. You, you know, because um, I think then you still um, there was like a tagline on the book that uh, talks about uh, 
when she couldn't find the perfect man, she made it. Uh, is that yeah. is that right? Yeah, when she uh, when she couldn't find Mr. Right, she built him. Yeah, so it's like they still used a version of that sort of in the in the tag there, which um, me personally, titles are sometimes the hardest thing. <laughs> so <Yeah>. I. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've had times where I'm like, I am fine with pretty much all the script, but like the title I'm just struggling with. Yeah, I feel like the title is, it's either the first thing or it's the last thing. It's like you get a title in your head and you're like, oh, that's cool. Like I should write something that fits with that. Or you're writing something and you have no idea what to call it. And you're like asking all your friends, like, what is this? <laughs> Bring yeah, some ideas. <laughs> absolutely. So, yeah, it, it can be tough. So you found, you, you found an agent. Uh, like how long was that was it kind of like months of the uh sending out uh like submissions and so forth and then like how long before yeah. you started that before you landed you're like I'm, I'm going with this this agent i think for me if i remember it was maybe two or three months um and you know everybody approaches the querying process differently so I, I know some writers who've done it who will put together like a bunch of query letters and send out you know 50 to 100 letters at once in like a big push and then they just wait to hear back. For me, I was doing it more like one letter at a time because I was trying to do a lot of research on the agents that I was reaching out to to make sure that I was really specifically targeting people who I thought might be a good fit as opposed to just kind of like carpet bombing <laughs> everyone I could find with my query letter. Sure, because um, it's like someone may say yes, but like, are they the right person for the job? Yeah, exactly. And also like, I don't want to waste their time. Like if I think, if I don't think that there is a real shot that it might be a good fit for them. Like, why am I sending them the letter? So I wanted to make sure that I was doing my due diligence to not waste my time or theirs and to make sure that there was like an actual chance with each of them. Um, so I, I did a fair amount of research for each agent I reached out to. And so I was only sending out, you know, maybe a few career letters a week because I was taking my time with it. So I was just doing it on a rolling basis for a few months. And I had maybe sent out like 20 to 30 letters at that point, I think. Um, some I had heard back from, some I hadn't heard back from. But then once this agent um, had read the manuscript and said that she was interested, basically I did what I think is a typical process, which is where you, you send out another email to all the people who you have outstanding queries to at that point, and just let them know like, hey, I have interest. If, if you wanna let me know, or if, if you are interested, let me know by a certain date. Um, and that kind of gives them just a last chance to say, just in case, like, you know, so you're not just, just to be polite, essentially. <laughs> just yeah. um, and so then I signed with this agent um, who actually is, is in London, which I wasn't quite sure how that would work to have an agent <laughs> overseas, but you know, she works with US publishers, so it, it, it all works out fine. Um, and once I started working with her, I did, um, she and, and her assistant at the time read and sent, sent me some really good comprehensive notes. And so I did a round of revisions with them. And then I think it was about, maybe like three to six months from the time when I signed with her to the time when she said, okay, it's ready to, to send out to editors. And so that's when she started putting it out on submission. Okay. So that was when you were finding the agent that was, you said around 2017. Yeah. I think it was like summer 2017. And then through the fall, I worked on revisions. And then I think it was like the maybe end of 2017, beginning 2018, that she sent the book out on submission. Okay. Um, and then, so by setting, uh, you know, now that you've done, you know, revisions and they think it's in a, a place to send out, mm -hmm. um, then at that point you're sending uh, to editors, you said, right? That's the next step? Right, yeah. So that part I, I really wasn't involved with because my agent kind of handled the whole thing. Um, and I don't know if that's the same for every agent, you know, some people might have their office be a little bit more hands on or might, you know, send them more information about like I have one writer friend who I think gets um, a spreadsheet from her agent of all of the, the editors that are being reached out to and what their responses are and that sort of thing. I personally didn't get anything like that. I was basically just like, okay, you take it and I'll just wait. And if I hear something, I hear something. Um, and it's kind of a nerve wracking process because having an agent definitely doesn't mean a guarantee of getting published. Like I've, I've known writers who, um, actually I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think that most books with agents that are sent out on submission don't end up getting published. So even once you, you know, reach that milestone, there's no guarantee. Um, and it's certainly possible to go through multiple books with an agent 
that don't sell before you finally sell one. Um, so I was waiting for maybe like a month or two um, before I heard that an editor was interested. And then I had a call with her just to talk kind of big picture about like some of the changes that she would want me to make just to make sure that we were on the same page about that and okay with it before they did the deal. Um, and I was, I was okay with it. I liked the ideas that she had. So they went ahead and negotiated the deal. And then I started working on another round of revisions with the editor at that point. Okay. And then um, now from, you know, kind of like those revisions with your agent versus the one with the editor, was that uh, kind of just like more, uh, you know, character and or switching kind of like to comedy and so forth? Was that like, uh, or, or any big changes in that round or? Yeah, I think it was, it was really kind of a lot of the same sorts of things, just pushing further in the same direction, like um, kind of what I was talking about earlier, like pushing it a little bit away from the comedy and a little bit more towards the romance. It was, it was really a continuation of that process. Um, and the change I mentioned about moving that one scene of the wedding around, which changed the structure a bit was something that my editor had the idea for, which I think helped in a lot of ways to develop the relationship between the characters in sort of a different way. Um, and it, it sort of changed like the cadence of how the relationship develops. And um, she also got a little bit more granular with her notes. Like we did, we did first a sort of big picture round where she gave me bigger notes and I made some changes based on that. And then she went through and did like really specific line by line edits. Um, and so then I did a round with that. And then once all that was done, then it still has to go to like the copy editor and get even more granular and that type of thing. But yeah, it was, it was a lot of like continuing to push the character work and the relationships and sort of gearing it a little bit more towards the book reading audience who might buy something like this as opposed to like my, my initial, my screenwriter brain was the one that first wrote the book. So I was kind of moving away from that a bit. Sure. Um, okay. So uh, you found the editor, you're going through the revisions. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said that's uh, when in 2018, like end of 2018 sort of? Or? So, yeah, I think we started working together like early 2018. Um, I think like maybe spring 2018 was when they signed the deal. And then by that July, I believe it was sometime that summer was when the final manuscript was delivered and accepted. Um, and so then it was about a year from that point to when it was actually published. So then that was when the process started of doing like the copy edits and the layout and the cover and um, sending out for reviews and all that sort of, you know, the marketing, PR, all that stuff. Yeah. So as far as like that process, um, mm -hmm. how much of it is like decisions with like maybe you and the publisher or like your agent, I guess, like, at some point, do they just like, no, this is where we're going? Or is it still like you get to approve stuff? Or what's what's that kind of like? So I can talk about my experience, but I, I will say that I think it's very different depending on your situation and what publisher sure. you're with. Um, for me, it was very much, I was not that hands-on with it. Like they basically, once they had the book, they kind of took it and ran with it. Um, like for instance, with the cover, you know, I, I've had other writer friends who have either very specifically worked to design their cover with like a smaller publisher or at least had some sort of say or, or feedback on it. For me, like I literally just got an email one day that was like, here's the cover. <laughs> so I really didn't have any input. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I had some input in terms of like looking at the copy edits, just okaying those. Um, when we started reaching out to other authors for blurbs, I was able to suggest some people to reach out to and to kind of write letters to some of them to try to, you know, grease the wheel. <laughs> um, you know, I, I wrote the acknowledgements, like stuff like that over that time period. But other than that, I really was not that involved. The publisher really handled most of it. Um, but I was working with a larger press. So I think sometimes if you're with a smaller press, the author tends to be a little bit more hands-on is my, my general understanding. Okay. Um, and now, now was that kind of like, was that Ner was that nerve wracking at all that a lot of the power was taken away from you or was it like, oh, well, this is kind of nice because I can, I can work on other stuff. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like, it's nerve wracking and reassuring at the same time. It's nerve wracking because like you're, you're giving your baby away to someone else <laughs> essentially and, and letting them do what they want with it. But I mean, for me as a first time author, like I knew nothing about publishing and I was lucky to be working with a major 
publisher where these people, you know, this is what they do and they're experts and they, they have the resources and they have the experience I don't. So I was willing to trust them. Um, but it is still, still nerve wracking, obviously, to know that you're basically putting not just this specific work, but a lot of like who you are as a writer and, and building your, your brand and your image as an author in someone else's hands. Um, so that was a little bit tough, but, um, but you know, obviously they, they're great at what they do. So I trusted them. Yeah. So, um, they, you know, they kind of took it from there. They, they, they put it all together. Mm -hmm. Um, and then was it pretty soon after that, that they're like, yeah, we're just going to release it. Or did they say like, oh, we're going to like announce this and like build to it. Or like, what was kind of like the, the marketing like for that? So I think, um, if I remember, I think they already, like when I started working with the publisher, we already decided kind of what the timeline would be, like try to get the final draft in by a certain date in July, and then publication date would be like a year after that. So I already sort of knew what the timing was and they had already planned that out. Um, but they, I think they have to start fairly early on in terms of like trying to sell it to bookstores and getting reviews and getting the marketing stuff going. Um, so like I've heard for self-published authors, the, the rule of thumb I think is by at least six months out, you should be starting to really intensively market stuff. So for traditionally published, I think the process can start even earlier because there's there might be more than they're doing. Um, but yeah, they, they knew the timeline pretty early on. They fixed that in stone. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, once uh, once they kind of put it out you know, physical copies, digital mm -hmm. copies. Um, what was that like? Did uh, going to some stores, did you go to some stores to see like, hey, it's on the shelf or like, what yeah. was that like? Yeah, it was it was cool, especially because um, when it first came out, I did like a small book tour. And um, I, I remember like being in the airport in I think it was San Francisco for one of my bookstore tops, stops. And the book was like there at one of the the airport stores where they have all the books for sale and stuff. So that was really cool to see. Um, it was in Target too for a while, which for me is like, you know, someone who always shops in Target. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's been really cool to see something that you create actually become like a physical, tangible object in the world that people can can buy and interact with just because, you know, writing is so, it's so ephemeral and it's so, um, individual and lonely in a way like it's just you with your thoughts in a room with a computer most of the time so to have something like actually real come out of that is really cool and really rewarding yeah so um that tour uh did, did you get to like beat people who had like read it and like kind of talked to some people uh what was that like yeah it was you know book tours are, are tough because i feel like so many times most of the people who go to bookstore events and library events are just people who know the author. <laughs> um, and I, I've seen that, you know, with my own events and with events that I go to for other writers, because I'm someone who actually will like look at the schedule that a bookstore has online and be like, oh, that looks cool, let me go to that. But I think not many people actually do that. So um, in the cities where I knew people, it was a lot easier to get people to come. And there was like one city I went to where I didn't know anybody and it was definitely a small crowd. <laughs> but it's still, it's still cool to like, you know, just to travel around and meet different bookstore owners and meet readers and be able to, you know, connect with, with friends I haven't seen in other cities and promote the book and that sort of thing. Um, and you, you typically you have to put together like a little bit of a, a talk that you give first and then you give the reading and then do some sort of a signing portion or Q&A. So it's, um, it's fun. It was, it was very different from anything I'd ever done before. Awesome. So, um, once uh once it was kind of like out um and yeah you're doing the tour and so forth um i guess what was it like are there you know because i think one thing us writers say is it's almost like things are never finished mm -hmm. where were you like oh i wish uh i could have you know gone this route with it or um uh, you're curious about like adapting it and so forth or are you just uh, you're just pretty happy that you were able to go from only just having the idea in 2015 to like 2019 like now it's it's on shelves and like people can hold it yeah I think well there's there's elements of both um to some extent I feel like it's been a while since I wrote this obviously and 
for me, I feel like I'm always changing and evolving as a writer and moving on to the next idea. So this one is kind of, even though I'm still continuing to, to talk about it and promote it and talk to readers and stuff, it's, it feels old to me in a weird way. <laughs> so <laughs> in some ways, mentally, I've, I've moved on from it. I'm working on other projects, but I still definitely feel like if I, if I could write it today, I think I would do it pretty differently. Um, and there's always things that I wish like, oh, I could go back and change that. <laughs> but once it's published, <laughs> obviously you can you kind of are stuck. <laughs> sure. But I think I, if I were to, to rewrite it now, I think for one thing, I would probably do it in first person as opposed to third. Like I think that would allow me to approach the main character in a different way and give a different sort of interiority to her. Um, and I think I might also push the robotic stuff a little bit further just because like robotics and AI obviously is such a rapidly evolving field in the real world. And with the research that I did for this, and even in just the years since I wrote it to now, I feel like some of my thoughts about AI and like the ethics around AI and that sort of thing have changed. So I might take that, the robot character Ethan and like go in slightly different directions with him and, and push those stories a little bit further. Um, which is one reason why actually the book was, was optioned for television and that was exciting to me because I almost saw that as an opportunity to like rejigger the story and take it in new directions and, and go places with the characters that I wasn't able to in the book. So I think some authors are very, if their book gets adapted or gets you know, picked up for adaptation, they're, they're kind of precious about it. And they're like, oh, I, I really want it to be a faithful literal adaptation. Like don't change too much. Whereas for me, I'm like, take it, like change it. <laughs> I'm happy for you to make whatever changes you want. If I were writing it, I would change a lot. So I'm not, I'm not too wedded to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think uh, whether like as a book or l let's say like if something doesn't happen TV wise, do you think you'd ever want to do like a sequel? Um, I would consider it. I think I would have to first of all figure out like what the take is for the story. Um, and I would also have to be in a place like personally as a writer where I really wanted to go back and do a sequel. I think for me now, like I, I'm more invested in projects that I'm writing at the moment, just because I kind of feel like with this one, like I wrote it, I did it, it had its place in my life. And now I'm, I'm like my head and my heart are in other things, but maybe, you know, 10 years from now, I might be like, Oh, I, I have some really great idea about Kelly and Ethan. And I want to pick that story back up and, and see where it goes. But, um, right now I'm not in a place where it's like that is what's really intriguing me but I would like if I had the opportunity to write a tv adaptation of it or do like say it did actually become a tv show um to do a script for that or something I think that would be a really cool challenge so that would be something I'd be interested in for sure yeah um yeah it's 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 crazy like sure four years sounds like a long time but um from idea to shelf you know that's uh that's pretty awesome. Like I, I, I'm sure there's people who work on the book for at least four years before they even <laughs> yeah. reach out to uh, agents and publishers. So um, I'm yeah, sure you get this question a lot. Do you have any advice for people who are interested in you know novel writing or just like working on books? Um, sure. I mean, I would say read as much as possible. I think that's always you know, there are a lot of writers out there and not as many readers proportionally. <laughs> so um, just to always keep reading, that's the best way to sort of learn as a writer. And I would say also use other writers as a resource, like writing by its nature is kind of um, an isolated task, I think. But reaching out to other writers to get feedback on your work is so invaluable. It can help you see the things that you can't see because um, you're just too close to it. And it can help you kind of get other perspectives just on your story individually, but also on life and on the world and hearing from people who come from different backgrounds than you and, and how they respond to your story. Um, and also giving feedback in return is really helpful. It's, it's a great exercise to be able to look at other people's writing and sort of analyze it in a critical way and think about not just how am I responding to this, but why am I responding that way? And if it's not the best possible response, what do I think I could suggest that they might be able to do to make it better? Um, so giving and receiving feedback is great. And also just getting to know other writers, like having that support system, because it is such a sort of isolated task. I think 
for me, my, my writer friends and writers groups are a great lifeline to be able to sort of um, bounce ideas around or just commiserate when it's not going well, hear about their, their experiences and their um, resources that we can trade and that sort of thing. So get to know other writers, support them, you know, ask them for help with what you're working on. Um, I think that's really helpful for everyone. Sure. And then I know one thing that you said during the trying to find like an agent process that you did a lot of kind of like research onto like people that probably made sense or um, people that maybe would uh, fit with your story. Uh, do you have any advice for that side of things for people who maybe have finished writing and now they're trying to figure out what to do with it? Because um, since this was your first, uh, had you had already known some of this process, uh, whether it's like through podcasts or videos, interviews and such, or was it like a whole new thing having to learn just that step? It was definitely a new thing. Um, I was kind of going into it blind. I, I really knew nothing about publishing. I didn't know anyone in the publishing world. Um, so I had to sort of research online and figure out the process. And I mean, there's, there's almost too much information on the internet about like how to get published and querying and that sort of thing. Um, Cause there are a lot of writers out there and there's a lot of, there's a lot of information. So it's definitely, it's not hard to find like guidelines for how to write a query letter and that sort of thing. Um, but you have to kind of, parse through the information and find what's useful to you. And I think for me, when, when I was trying to figure out like who to query and find agents, um, to some extent, I sort of worked backwards. Like I started thinking about books that I thought were in some way similar to mine or that sold to an audience and might, you know, also be interested in reading mine and then seeing, okay, well, who represents that author and then researching that agent and trying to find out what she or he was interested in. Um, most agents these days have a pretty decent online presence, so you can probably find information on their websites, on social media. Uh, a lot of them will give interviews in, in journals and stuff that you can read. So I found it was pretty easy to find information on the agents that I looked at and to find, you know, who they represent and things they've said before about what they're interested in, that kind of thing. Um, so just pulling from that information, there's also something called Manuscript Wishlist, which is helpful. There's a website, manuscriptwishlist.com. And then there's also a hashtag on Twitter. I think it's hashtag MSWL, I believe, where agents will post things that they're looking for. So they might say like, I, I want a YA book about rocket science. I don't know, <laughs> um, just something that they, they're interested in. And so you can use that to kind of look for agents who are looking for something similar to what you've written. Um, so there's a lot of tools out there to try to find like what agents are interested in and, and who might be a good fit for you. So I tried to take advantage of those when I was doing the process. Yeah, that makes sense. So now I'd love to kind of talk a little bit about the story mm -hmm. um, because yeah, it uh, I, I had a lot of fun. Um, so, to, to talk a little bit more about this, uh, how would you describe, uh, I'd be curious how you would describe Kelly mm -hmm. um, kind of like at the start of the story. So obviously she's a robotics engineer, um, but like some things that I personally kind of like related to her is like how you kind of, I think played with her anxiety and kind of like how she um, will like look at certain situations and then almost like think about this possibility, this possibility, and then like obviously always like the worst possibility. <laughs> so like, was there some personal experience uh, with uh, with that with Kelly or, or how? Yeah, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the the main character there. Yeah, she is. I don't know if I would call her a full on basket case, but <laughs> she has some issues. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. Yeah. Um, I mean, she is sort of a type that you see a lot in romantic comedies and that she does well in her work. Like she's smart, she's successful, she's ambitious, she's, she's doing well in her career side of things, but her personal life is not going as well. Um, and I feel like you see that dichotomy a lot in like rom-com books and movies for whatever reason. But she, um, when, so I, I think I said earlier that I came up with the story first and then was kind of worked backwards to the characters. So I knew that I wanted this to be about like a female robotics engineer who builds the perfect boyfriend. And then I had to kind of think backwards of, okay, like what character 
would do that? And what character do I want to see go on that journey? Like what character do I think could learn and grow and evolve from that in, in interesting ways? Um, so I sort of built her as a character who she is, she's lonely and she wants to find love and romance, even though she isn't necessarily fully admitting that to herself in the, in the story. Um, but she, she has struggled in relationships in the past. She struggles to open up to people. She's also just like a little bit awkward. <laughs> so some of her social interactions don't go so well, which I can personally relate to. <laughs> um, and I also gave her this mother character who is, uh, maybe you could call her a foil to Kelly. She's in her own way, she's a career woman as well. Like she works in the wedding industry and runs this bridal shop and she's very successful in that sphere. But she also is very into like the personal and domestic sphere of things and has very traditional ideas about love and romance and everybody needs to get married and everybody has to do it on a certain timeline and that kind of thing. So she really pushes Kelly and Kelly almost reacts against that of like, no, I'm, I'm just going to be single forever and let my cat beat me when I'm 80. <laughs> and that's, a, that's basically like her, her way of trying to get her mom off her back. So um, that helps to push her to, to build this plus one as well when she needs a wedding date. So I don't know, I, I wanted to think about a character who would potentially get something out of a relationship with a robot, because I think initially she's able to be herself around Ethan and open up with him in ways that she can't with a, a human man because she's less self-conscious. She thinks of him as just this tool. So she's she's not really, um, she, she loses some of the anxieties and the hangups that she normally has in relationships when she's with him, um, which was an interesting dynamic for me to develop, I think. Yeah, because like, I think when, when I originally, you know, I, I had heard this premise, you, you know, uh, uh, about your book and, and um, knew that it was like more on like kind of the romantic side. It's like, I could see someone writing the angle of like someone's like super desperate for love and like they they do it like for love. And like you said, I think there's a part of her that wants to find love, mm -hmm. but it almost starts that she's just, like you said, being pressured so much uh, to uh, to, find a date to finally start settling down and she almost just does it out of obligation first and then that's where it like grows into more um which yeah like i uh obviously uh i i, I have a son mother relationship but like i've heard plenty of of friends that have kind of like a mother daughter relationship where uh yeah it is very like why aren't you you know thinking about marriage and kids already and like mm -hmm. what and like it was <laughs> I, I, I she wasn't like an antagonist the mom but yeah. it's just like she felt very like yeah i could see someone having this mom like do you have maybe not necessarily like your mom, but like, do you have experience, whether it's like with friends or uh, just like seeing it in your life, like this type of, this type of mom? Yeah, I think, I mean, she's pretty different from my own mom. My own parents, if anything, were always very like hands off about that sort of thing and didn't push me and my sister to, to have certain types of relationships or move on a certain timeline or anything. Um, so it's, it's not based on my personal experience, but I've definitely seen this type of dynamic in other families before. And I think in some ways it might feel a little anachronistic. I think there's a lot less of that sort of, at least society-wide pressure for, for people and women in particular to you know, follow a certain relationship path and um, you know, get married by, by the age of 25 or whatever. Um, but I, I think it's still out there. And it was, it was almost interesting to me to take that, that mindset, which is a little bit old fashioned and set it in Silicon Valley and to have that juxtaposition of like this career woman who is working at, you know, the cutting edge of robotics. And yet she still also has to face these pressures that a lot of people in society face. And she still has the same worries and anxieties that a lot of us face too. Um, I really wanted to make sure that she, even though she has this, this cool career and she's doing stuff that's way outside of certainly my experience and the normal experiences of a lot of people, that she still felt kind of relatable and grounded and, like she's dealing with normal human concerns too. So I think having the family stories helped to kind of bring in some of that dynamic. 
for sure. Um, yeah, do you, do you mind if we say uh, how, how old you are? Um, sure, I'm, I'm 33. Okay, because yeah, so so I'm 29, and and yeah, so I I have a lot of friends like in our age range, and I do really feel like that is like it's still a even though it is sort of old fashioned like the societal thing, um, and and I'm not sure if uh, you said your parents you weren't necessarily feeling it probably you know when you were in your late 20s you know closer to when you were writing this, um, but uh, a a big thing that. I remember numerous times the mom would be like, because uh, Kelly, the character is 29, mm -hmm. and numerous times the mom would be like, you're almost 30. Yeah. And she's like, no, I'm only 30. Exactly. You know, like, and I think that is something that I have heard from whether it's like family members or uh, old neighbors or coworkers or whatever it may be. Uh, like I said, not necessarily to me, but it's it's something that's put on to women because it's like oh you got to be in a relationship by this time engaged married mm -hmm. and then by like 30 you got to start having kids and it's just like well have you ever stopped to ask whether that's something that this woman or person even wants <laughs> yeah and i think it's it's funny because it's kind of context dependent in some ways too like i was you know i'm from north carolina I spent a lot of time living in Los Angeles um, and I was, I guess, 25 when I got married and compared to a lot of people in North Carolina, um, that was not that young, but in LA working in the entertainment industry at the time, everyone was like, oh my gosh, you're like a child bride. Like, why are you getting married so young? <laughs> like most people or a lot of people in that industry, if they get married at all, it's not until they're like in their thirties or forties. So because really they're, they're more career uh, oriented yeah. usually. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, you know, I'm someone that I, I got married at, at 23 and, you know, and then divorced at 25. And it's, it's crazy because we think about like our parents, I don't know how old your parents when they got married, but like my parents were like 1920 when they got married. Yeah. That seems so young. But then like when people my age, uh, like when I was in my early to mid twenties getting married, everyone said like, that's young. But mm -hmm. then also it's like some point, something flips from like you're young to you're old. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, why, why is it like 23 or something is too young, but then 25, it's like, uh, um, you better, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> better it's speed all, things up. <laughs> it's so subjective. And it's also like, um, I don't know. I, I feel personally in some ways, like I'm younger and older than I am at the same time. Like I never know what age I should feel like. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't, you can't map your life timeline according to other people or other standards, I guess is, is a good takeaway. Like it's different for everyone. Um, and it evolves so rapidly too. Like, like you were saying, it's very different now than it was for our parents' generation for sure. Well, yeah. And, and cause the, yeah, the wedding is such a, a big, part of the story mm -hmm. which so like that was the part I, I I am glad it wasn't too late in the story um I was worried that like it was all like that and when she has to give a speech for work we're like all going to be at the end and mm -hmm. you know um but like by I think by putting in the middle uh it, it makes sense where she kind of thrust herself into like, well, I need a date and I can't mm -hmm. find a date. Um, because like, that's another like kind of societal thing too, is like some people are really weird about single people being at weddings, mm -hmm. you, you know, like it's this this big no-no. Um, uh, so then some so many people have this like guilt and or pressure to either find someone to bring, you know, or it's like, why not? Like, I don't know what's wrong with someone bringing a friend, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's part of why I had the, the mother character, Diane, as well, because, I mean, in reality, I think, and I think most people think, like, if you want to come to a wedding by yourself, that's fine. <laughs> like, who cares? Unless, unless you're there to get married, you really don't need to have somebody with you. <laughs> right, because um, it's not about the people who are, the, it's about the people yeah. getting married. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's kind of how Kelly feels about it, but her mom... You know, she, she works in the wedding industry and she is planning this wedding for um, Kelly's sister, her other daughter. And so it's a very big personal milestone for her, but it's also like a big professional event where she knows she's going to have other friends from within the industry there kind of seeing her work. So she, 
as opposed to a bridezilla, she's kind of like the mother of the bridezilla. Like she goes crazy with this wedding planning and everything has <laughs> to be like totally perfect. And so in her mind, it's like Kelly has to be there with a date um, and he has to like fit the part and look right in the pictures and all this stuff. So I had to, I had to sort of give a little bit of extra pressure there to make it such a big deal for Kelly. Cause otherwise I think you're right. Like most people would, would not think it was that big of a deal. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think though that like, while some of us, you know, can look at it and be like, yeah, that's, it's just so ridiculous. But for some people like this is wildly their life, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and one thing that, that, that I'll say uh, I really related to is so my mom didn't like work in the wedding industry and she wasn't so like, oh, you need to do this by this. But like, she does seem to have a sense of, you know, what they kind of, I think a lot of people call like catastrophizing. Mm-hmm. um where I think there was a scene where like Kelly walked in and the mom was like what's wrong <laughs> and I was just like <laughs> I was like that happened to me a couple weeks ago and I saw my mom <laughs> <laughs> so I, I it just like I was like I think I had to pause at one point and be like all right that is <laughs> that is so accurate I'm sure other mm-hmm. readers related to that whether it's like with a mom or a dad but um did, yeah, did that we, come from anything? Uh, was that from your parents or was that just, you, you know, people who like always are worst case scenario and then they're, they're writing this whole narrative. Like I, mm-hmm. the mom would do it a couple of times. It's like, well, if you don't do this by this time and then this time and then da 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 da. And she like goes on this whole tirade yeah. and it's just like, <laughs> wow, you got that from this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's not a reflection on my own mother, <laughs> but I think um, one thing that I kind of had fun with was playing with like the differences and the similarities between Kelly and her mother, because they, they're kind of at, at odds with each other for a lot of the story, but they're also similar in more ways maybe than they realize, which I think is true for a lot of mothers and daughters. Like the older you get, the more you realize like, oh wow, I am my parents, <laughs> whether I knew it or not. Um, and I think, Kelly and Diane, her mom, both have a lot of anxieties, but they sort of manifest in different ways. And so Diane is that catastrophizer of like um, imagining the worst case scenario and jumping 20 steps ahead of like, you have to make everything perfect, even about things that Kelly seem kind of silly or petty. Whereas Kelly doesn't really get anxious about those sorts of things, but she is a catastrophizer in her own way, maybe more socially. Like she tends to get really anxious about interactions with people and what are they gonna think of her and what is she gonna do that's gonna mess everything up. And so they both have those sort of like spiraling moments <laughs> that, that happen in different ways and they drive each other crazy with their anxieties. Whereas in some senses you're like, well, maybe you could just like talk about this and relate to each other because you're actually not as different as you think you are. <laughs> Um, And and so I I had a few different things in the story like that, where I kind of tried to show the parallels between Kelly and her mom, even though they don't necessarily relate to each other um, that easily a lot of the time. Sure. Um, So one thing that's kind of like an inciting incident uh, towards the beginning is Kelly has uh, kind of an argument with a psychologist. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Forgive me, I'm forgetting the psychologist's name. Um, I think it was Dr. Masden. He's, he's yeah. there to help her work on a project for work. That sounds right. And like, what's interesting is, you know, I knew he would, uh, I, the writer in me was like, oh, well, he's got to come back later. Um, he he kind of calls Kelly out, like for all of her issues when, when um, and I don't remember the exact chapter that happens, mm-hmm. but it felt uh, pretty early on. And it's almost like that was like a big catalyst for her to have someone yell at all of her flaws. Mm-hmm. And, but then we proceed to then see those flaws pan out like the whole book. Um, so I guess I'm curious, uh, w- w- when did that, uh, cause I found that it was such an interesting idea to have like a psychologist totally like diagnose and call out all the faults of the character when we, as the readers are still just getting to know the character. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, if you want to kind of talk about like that either moment or just the thought of bringing in a psychologist, uh, to kind of just totally 
pick apart our main character uh, before we even know if that's true or not. Yeah, and I think in some ways that that's kind of a risky move because I don't want to like turn readers off from her right away and, and just kind of show all of her flaws up front. So I, I tried to put in a, a little bit in the beginning too, of like seeing her actually doing well with her job and seeing that she's not just a total mess. <laughs> but um, I really wanted to explore the idea with Kelly that she is a character who is very much a work in progress and she is in denial about a lot of things, like a lot of the issues that she has. She doesn't really accept or um, understand in the beginning of the story. And so she, she starts out of this place where she's like, yeah, I, I really don't need help. I don't need input. I don't need other people. Um, and so she rejects everything that the psychologist who's supposed to be collaborating with her on a robotics project that she's working on. She rejects everything that he's saying, both for the project and then when he kind of like gets frustrated and turns it on her, she rejects everything that he's saying about her. Um, but over the course of the story, she starts to actually, through her relationship with Ethan, realize that more and more of those things are true and that she should work on them. And she comes to a place towards the end where she is more willing to accept that help and accept that, that need to work on herself. Um, so it was a good way to kind of highlight up front all these problems that she has so we can then get her to a place by the end where not that she's necessarily solved those problems, but at the very least she is more open to solving them and better equipped to start working on herself. Yeah, because, yeah, I wouldn't say, you know, that, she, like you said, she's not a total mess. She's just, like, I think socially and, you know, personally, uh, but, like, you know, professionally, she, you know, is doing well and mm -hmm. she's wildly intelligent and so forth. But, um, yeah, it's, and it's such an interesting, because then it's, like, the device of I'm teaching this robot how to be more human mm -hmm. yet like there's little times where it's like by doing that I think she's realizing how kind of like ridiculous she is or yeah. just how it's like well should you be teaching someone how to be a human when like you're not the best at it <laughs> not that anyone's <laughs> the best but you know what I mean <laughs> yeah exactly and, and I think she sees to some extent how complicated being a human is and how complicated relationships are as she's trying to do things like you know she can she can program him on sort of the hard stuff about learning languages or things like that but when it comes to like how do you give someone a sense of humor or at least make it so that they could interact in a conversation with other people and know how to respond appropriately to stuff that's supposed to be funny versus stuff that's not supposed to be funny like that's so nuanced and so um subjective that she as she starts kind of digging into these issues of humanity and like how people deal with each other she has to address those in order to work on Ethan mm -hmm. um, and also in relating to him she starts to see more about like how she relates to other people so I, I think that um, the the robotics and the technology in the book to me are interesting in their own right but they're also I, I was primarily exploring them through the lens of like what they say about us as humans and how we interact with each other because I, I think that's really interesting yeah, I, I I think that um, th those those were specific scenes that uh, I enjoyed. Where, like you said, she had to kind of explain humor to mm -hmm. e uh, Ethan the robot, and uh, that's something that you know, a as a comedian and someone who likes to write a lot of comedic things. Um, I, I, I will always say, and you know, other people could disagree. I, that's why I always think like comedy in general is the most hard, the, like the most difficult genre to write mm -hmm. compared to all other genres because it is so subjective. Because yeah. like, sure, Kelly could tell him what's funny, but that's what Kelly thinks is funny and maybe not like her brother or sister or parents find funny. Right. Um, and so like, that was so interesting. That's like, and I feel like it's almost like something that you may have to do maybe for certain young kids, like when you're explaining how like jokes and like sarcasm and, you know, that when someone's kidding, like how that works is because some of us, you know, you know, we're both in our, you know, late twenties, early thirties. It's like, we've been doing it our whole lives. So it's like, mm -hmm. we kind of understand it. But if you had to explain that concept to someone who has zero idea, it's just, just like, oh, uh, mm, how do I? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also there was a scene, I don't I don't know if it was the same scene, but they were having to teach Ethan 
to quote unquote speak normal because mm -hmm. like he was sounding too like sophisticated and like certain answers he was giving on you know because he had like the internet you know at his disposal yeah. on his brain <laughs> uh, and it's like well how do you teach someone to speak normal when that's like a subjective thing <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I think I'm trying to remember I think that she at some point tells him to like spend a lot of time on social media or just spend a lot yeah, of time yeah. to like dumb them down. <laughs> like talk more how these people are talking. And then um, she realizes how like dumb people talk and she's like, oh wow, that, that was a big yeah, mistake. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't, don't go that far. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it is funny with the humor thing. Like it's, I didn't make a big deal out of it in the book, but it's just an interesting idea to me. Like how do you explain what makes something funny or not? Um, and I know, I'm sure you've, been there on Twitter, but like trying to explain a joke to someone is like the most painful thing in the world. <laughs> when, you, when you write something that's meant to be funny and then people are replying to it in like a very serious way, it's just, it's painful. Yeah. So that's, that's one of those things that I think maybe you just have to be human to understand. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if we ever get like robots or AI entities of any sort that actually can truly understand human humor and, and respond to it in kind. I don't think we're there yet, but um, that would be interesting to see if it ever happens for sure. Yeah. So um, besides maybe Kelly or Ethan, do you have like favorite characters that you loved exploring? Um, maybe like Priya or maybe like the parents or the siblings or... Yeah. Um, so Priya was a lot of fun for me. She's Kelly's best friend. She works alongside her at the robotics company. Um, and they, they're kind of different in terms of their personalities. Like Priya is a lot more outgoing. She's a lot more sort of free spirited. Um, she's much more open and adventurous in relationships. So she, um, she and Kelly, like, sorry, my dog is saying something out the window. <laughs> um, she and Kelly, um, they support each other a lot, but they, they have very different perspectives on relationships. So she's, she's kind of like Kelly's cheerleader a lot of times, but there's also conflict that comes up between them over time because um, Kelly is trying to keep Ethan's real identity a secret from Priya. And so that sort of drives a wedge between them. Um, so Priya was a lot of fun to write because she's just so different from Kelly and she brought like a lot of life and levity to a lot of those scenes, I think. Um, also another, he's a pretty small character, but Kelly's brother I think his name is Gary was fun for me he's he's this guy who used to be like a super goth teen <laughs> in high school he would like draw pentagrams on his face with eyeliner and stuff and now he's like a father to like three or four children like small children and so he's very much like the homebody stay-at-home dad um, but he he was fun for me because he's kind of the most chill person in Kelly's family like there's a lot of mm -hmm. anxiety within the family and a lot of tension and a lot of like pressure on Kelly and her, Gary is the one who he kind of pushes her in, in good ways when she needs it but um he's a little bit more understanding and forgiving of her and sort of like the oasis within the family for her um so he was fun for me to write as well yeah he's yeah he's definitely the more like level-headed mm -hmm. um character um it was interesting. Uh, I was wondering, because, uh, and we don't necessarily have to say, uh, you know, super details for if, if those are listening and they, and they want to read or listen to the book. Mm -hmm. But when you lay out the premise that she makes this robotic boyfriend, Ethan, and then trying to get him prepped for the wedding, um, but then she's kind of like falling for him. Um, obviously like the big tension is when and her largest anxiety is when is someone going to figure it out mm -hmm. and then like what's that fallout um and i kept trying to guess i'm like who's gonna be the one to like put this together or is she gonna have to just tell someone mm -hmm. um and then how are people gonna respond because like it could very easily just be like what the fuck you know like it could turn totally just like yeah. are you crazy um so what was it like kind of deciding that kind of like reveal because much of the book is only she and ethan know the truth mm -hmm. yeah i think um 
so the the sort of final moment when the truth really comes out, I I won't give away specifics, but I kind of had an idea of that early on. Like I I knew where the story was going to go. Um, you mean when then, when a majority of the characters will know? Yeah, exactly. There are like some smaller points along the way where people find out. Um, but I think like anytime you have a story where a character has a secret, that's a good way to sort of drive tension and, and keep things moving along in ways that are interesting and that, you know, there's inherent kind of conflict and drama and suspense in that. Um, and that's part of why when, when we were uh, looking at developing this, this for TV, I started working with a production company. Um, one of the comps that I looked at, I, I told them was the show Younger on, I think it's TV land or maybe it moved to Hulu or something. Um, but that's another show where the main character has a secret. She's, she's hiding her age so that she can work in the publishing industry and she's pretending to be like two decades younger than she is. Um, and that drives the story season after season is that she has this big secret and eventually like, okay, by the end of season one, this major character finds out. And then by the end of season two, this character finds out and that sort of thing. So they, you know, when you have a series, you, you really drag it out. In a book, I didn't drag it out that much but it is a good way to sort of generate that, that conflict throughout and to build tension for the character too, because Kelly starts making increasingly irrational choices <laughs> as she's trying to basically protect the secret over time. Well, yeah, because especially at, at a certain point, because um, yeah, the, I do think though that the mother character is very much what caused not only the, the daughter uh well for kelly to feel the pressure to build a boyfriend you know specifically for the wedding mm -hmm. but then later when another kind of twist happens the mother's also kind of the cause of that and yeah. um and, and that's why it's like the secret just gets prolonged and that's where i i just was just like when is you know uh who's gonna find out when 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 they're oh Obviously, uh, I kind of was figuring too, like the big moment uh, towards the end would be when like a majority of the characters would figure it out. But then mm -hmm. um, what would the outcome be? You know, so yeah. I, I think what was what, what, what was it like? Uh, were you tempted to go like really dark with it? Were, 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 you, ten uh, were you playing with different, uh, I guess, endings based on when that uh, plot uh, is revealed to everyone. Yeah, I mean, I think there there definitely could be some dark versions of this story. Um, and certainly just with the idea of like robotics in general, there are a lot of much darker, more serious, even dystopian post-apocalyptic takes <laughs> on that subject matter. So I knew that I wanted to keep this lighter and much more romantic comedy and much more like focused on the human relationship side of it as opposed to really digging into like the darkest timeline <laughs> version of the story, I guess. Um, so I would say, I mean, the ending tonally is kind of bittersweet. There's good and bad parts to it, which I always enjoy in an ending. Um, so I knew from the beginning that I wanted to go in that direction. But yeah, I think it was just a matter of, of trying to stretch the tension out for Kelly in ways where it's driving more and more um, issues for her as the story goes on and pushing her as a character to make choices that she wouldn't be making before um, and to, to really come, kind of come to a breaking point as a character. So that's sort of what I was thinking about as I was structuring it. Sure. Um, all right. Well, yeah, I, cause yeah, I, I do want to avoid spoilers just because I, I, I really will encourage, uh, not just cause I know Sarah, but um, it was a fun uh, listen and read. Please check out the plus one, whether you are someone that prefers to read it physically or uh, to listen to the audiobook. Um, uh, it, it, it is a it is a good time. There are some things you know I didn't see coming. Some things that uh, were really funny, uh, and so yeah, I, I I think it's really enjoyable, and and I hope that someday we can see. A version of this like on screen because um, I think there's a lot of possibilities whether they do do it like you say like faithfully or you know make changes like there are possibilities. Yeah thank you I, I mean obviously I would love to see it on screen too and I think it's it's exciting because it is such a topical idea that if they turned it into a series 
you know, whether it started today or that started five years from now, you kind of approach things differently depending on what's going on in the real world of um, robotics and technology and stuff. So I don't know, I, I think I would be, for me, just as like a viewer, I would be interested to see where it went. Um, but yeah, I, I really appreciate you reading it. <laughs> yeah, sure. definitely. It was fun. I'm, I'm glad I finally got to do it. Um, so would you kind of like to tell uh, maybe a little bit of, uh, you mentioned you're working on another novel. Uh, do, do you want to reveal anything about that yet? Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a work in progress. So um, it could change and who knows what will happen with it, where it will go. But it's another romantic comedy um, slash contemporary romance is kind of how it's uh, categorized in the publishing world. Um, this one is much more grounded. There are no robots, <laughs> it's all people. Um, and it's a more sort of personal story for me. It takes place in North Carolina, which is, is where I live and where I've grown up. Um, it has to do with a lot of like mental health issues, some of which are personal to me. So it's, it's still comedic in tone, but it does dig into some kind of more serious emotional issues. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been enjoying working on that and I feel like it's still just continuing that process of like stretching me as a writer and pushing me in new directions, which is always good. Cool, well, um, where uh, would you like to plug your website and social medias again for everyone? Yeah, so my website is saraharcherwrites.com um, and there are links from there to my social medias. I think on, I have different handles on different places. I think it's um, Sarah Archer Writes on Instagram and it might be something different on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go to my website, it's all yeah. there. We'll, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely plug uh, the website and everything below. Um, but you. yeah, please uh, please check out uh, her stuff as we keep following uh, what uh, she's working on next. But um, yeah, uh, anything else you'd like to say about like just this whole process from, you know, getting to publish a book? Um, it's It's been a wild ride, but it's been really cool. I think the biggest takeaway I've gotten out of all of it is maybe to just focus on the writing itself. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs, whether you're trying to publish or whether you're working as a screenwriter, anything with writing, it's, it's a crazy world. It's very subjective. It's very competitive. You can't really control um, what's going to happen with your work or how people are going to respond to it or what opportunities you're going to have. So I really work on just trying to find joy and fulfillment in the writing itself and writing what I want to read. Um, and then hopefully good things will happen with it. You know, I, I had been writing for years before I got this book published. I'm sure I will write many other projects in the future that don't go anywhere. So you just have to kind of write what you want to write and follow your passion, I think. For sure. Well, really appreciate you coming on the podcast and doing this, this breakdown with us. Uh, um, you know, hopefully if there are some writers out there, you learned something. Uh, if not, hopefully you just uh, got a pretty big reason to check out this book because yeah it, it was a lot of fun but um yeah thanks again so much for coming on Sarah yeah thanks for having me this was a lot of fun <laughs>